Welcome to the Internet of Things Made Simple. I'm Larry Bohumer. This is episode number five, and I thank you for listening. As always, remember our new webpage, the Internet of Things Made Simple.com, has some great material on IoT. In our main topic tonight, we're going to be talking about the top 10 things you need to know about the upcoming launch of 5G. But before we get to that, we're going to open with something that affects many people, and that's the possible demise or downfall of the role of cashier. Many of us started out our careers as cashiers. It might have been at a retail store, or perhaps it was at a restaurant, and it was a role that always seemed easier than it really was. People look at it and say, ah, you just take money and scan things. How hard could it be? Well, you know what? A great cashier is worth their weight in gold. About 20 years ago, there was a great IBM commercial that kind of foreshadowed some of the technology that's out there today. And in the commercial, if you remember it, and you could find it on YouTube, the gentleman walks around the store and there's a security guard watching him and the guy's putting things into his pockets and you assume that the guy's stealing. And when he actually walks past the cashier, you're thinking, oh great, the security guard's going to grab him. But instead, the security guard just grabs the receipt and passes it to him saying, sir, you forgot your receipt because all the checkout had taken place automatically. And obviously, 20 years ago, that was well ahead of its time. But that's something that's actually happening today. Stores like Amazon Go have made this a reality. All you do is walk around the store, take whatever you like, put it into your bag or in your pocket, and then it charges a pre-approved credit card on the way out. People are often missing one important point about this, though. The reason why this system works is due to an incredible amount of sensors and cameras And I'm not sure everyone's actually paying attention to the security and, more importantly, the privacy issues that this brings. And what I mean by that is, who knows where this data goes? Um, Amazon is not just using this to create sales. They're actually using this technology to learn about people. And yes, they're doing it as a batch. So they're going to say, you know, 40-year-old men tend to go towards this product and not you particularly. But I'm not sure people have thought about this. But it also brings up another point. Are we really just increasing the demise of the cashier? Most of us use self-checkouts, especially those under 50, if they're available. And I honestly prefer them myself. I've gotten pretty good at barcode scanning. But are we actually just making sure that this job is going away? Well, it's not going to go away overnight. There are 3 million people, according to the Department of Labor, that list their occupation as a cashier. And that's just in the U.S. So it's going to take a while. But once people start getting used to technology, how fast it's accepted and used can really gain traction. Just look at pumping your own gas. When I was a kid, and I'm in my mid-40s, you always had somebody pump your gas for you. The idea of self-serve was pretty rare, if at all. Now, when's the last time you had somebody pump your gas for you? I know there's certain states in the U.S., I think it's New Jersey, where they still mandate it, but that's definitely the exception. And people complained at first about pumping their own gas, but after a while, it just, you know what, became part of life. And I think the demise of the cashier, whether it's you checking out yourself or these advanced systems like Amazon Go, are just inevitable. And I just wonder, is it going to be like when I tell my kids that somebody used to pump our gas and they don't really believe me? Is that going to be the same when they tell their kids that we had to stand in line at the cashier? When we come back from a few second break, we're going to talk about the top 10 things you need to know about 5G. Back in five seconds. Okay, welcome back. One comment that I had from our previous podcast where I did a top 10 list was I didn't actually list off the number for each point. So I said, this is the first point and then just went to the second and third point. And I was joking around with the person who made the comment saying, I guess you've forgotten how to count. So in order for this person not to complain again, I'm going to actually list off the number before each point. The first thing that you should know about 5G is that it's mostly about speed. And that's point number one. It is very fast. How fast? Well, you hear some numbers out there, but we're never going to be quite that fast when it comes to real life because those numbers take place on networks that are very underutilized. 
And let's face it, you're not going to see those speeds in downtown Manhattan on a Friday afternoon when everyone's pretending to be in the office. But you are going to see speeds that are probably going to be six to 10 times faster than what you have today. And depending on what you're doing, that might actually make a huge difference. If what you're doing is viewing the latest cat video on YouTube, I don't think it's going to make a difference because there wasn't much buffering going on on most 4G networks. But if what you're doing is real-time applications, and we're going to talk about latency in a future point, it will make a huge difference. So I think depending on how much you truly need speed and how fast you're able to send information, the extra speed from 5G might be a huge lifesaver. Point number two, and this is what I was just referring to, is that it's a lot lower latency. And that makes things much more real time than ever before. If you're trying to do an application that needs connectivity that is close to real time, like a phone conversation, you can handle a little bit of latency or delay in the network. It might just be an extra half second sometimes here and there for the information to go back and forth. But you can normally deal with that. And the same goes for video transfer because you can just buffer and other technologies. When it came to true real time, 4G didn't quite cut it. So if you look at the idea of real time surgery, where a surgeon might move something on their end and it will move the equipment on the other end, if all you had was 4G, I guess you dealt with it. But it was never optimized for real time traffic. The latency that's involved in 5G drops down to a point that it's almost wireline or landline level. Not quite, but it is getting there. And so that's going to make a lot of real-time applications much more efficient. The same goes for things that are extremely secure. If you're looking at some of the high-end government work, perhaps some really big financial transfers, any kind of delay might allow for the potential of that packet being sniffed or stolen. And a lot of these people wouldn't use wireless because they didn't quite know what was going on with that delay across the network. When you get to more real time, there's less chance of that packet have been looked at. And because of that, you're gonna see some more high secure applications now starting to move towards cellular. Point number three has to do more with the network side, but it's just more of an FYI for you. And this has to do with the different towers that are involved and how it might make some rollouts more difficult. If you ask the average person what a cell tower looks like, they're going to point to some ugly monstrosity thing at the side of the road that most municipalities fought to keep out. And that's because the towers covered a much bigger area, so it generally had to be a little taller to see over things. That's not quite the same when it comes to 5G. The frequency, and I don't get too nerdy here, simply doesn't travel as far. So you need to have many more towers that cover a little less area for each one. So instead of having this huge tower in someone's backyard or the side of the highway, what you're going to have instead are towers that are often as small as a pizza box. And they're going to have to be placed much closer to where people are. So much closer to street level, for instance, in a downtown core. And that's going to make things more difficult because it was a lot easier for a city just to say, okay, you can use the top of this building for a tower. What do you do when it comes to things that are closer to ground level? Where does the the carrier put these boxes? One thing that the Trump administration has done, and a lot of people don't like what they've done in many cases, but this is one area that should help the industry. And that's they're trying to take away some of the barriers that are being put up to allowing this connectivity to take place. So they're making it much easier for permits to be given to cell carriers to actually place their towers where they need to be. So that should help out the rollout. Point number four is a term that I've mentioned a couple times, and that's what's referred to as massive IoT. And what it's referring to is the incredible, phenomenal capacity these networks are going to have to support many users. Many times now, users simply find that the signal degradates when you get too many people in a certain area. And I think that kind of makes sense. There's always some limiting factor to how many people or how much bandwidth can be in a certain area. What you're going to see now is 5G is introducing massive IoT, as I mentioned, and that's going to allow up to a million people in a square mile, as an example, to actually have connectivity. And the reason that's important is, is that if you're asking companies to put 5G into everything, 
they're going to want to make sure that there's optimal connectivity wherever the device goes. And that's why this is a technology breakthrough that should make it much easier. And that's going to help out a lot of things like self-driving cars, um, because eventually at some point, each car on the road is going to be transmitting huge amounts of data all the time while it's driving. And that's something the carriers are both looking forward to and and are nervous about, to be honest. The fifth point is that it's going to lower down cost. And that's great. You might think lower cost. Next point. But I wanted to delve further as to what the implication might be to the overall world of technology, especially on the consumer side. If you're doing a product for the home, say a smart toaster, for instance, or a smart stove, it might not have made financial sense for the vendor to actually put cellular on board just because the bill of materials for a toaster were so low. And what happened was, if the device was smart, they put in a Wi-Fi chip. But that meant that the end user had to actually enable it on their Wi-Fi network and make sure it stays up there all the time. If that connectivity was an important part of the overall experience, so say in the example of a smartwatch, people do want the connectivity to be able to upload it to the cloud, then the chances of the end user keeping that device on the network are quite high. I have mentioned before, I have a smart stove at home, and the only time I've ever had it connected to the Wi-Fi network was when I had an issue and the customer service person asked me to enable it to the Wi-Fi network. They then made some kind of a software upgrade over the air and it fixed the stove. After that, I didn't see a reason to leave the stove on the Wi-Fi network. I'm, I'm not talking to it on the Wi-Fi network, so why would I want it on there? The manufacturer, though, does want that stove on the network at all times. They do want to get user data and they do want to see how things are being used and how different parts are working on the device. With 5G technology bringing down the cost of connectivity, Now it's more likely that you're going to see definitely the stove will have cellular connectivity on board for the manufacturer. But even that smart toaster, it's going to start making financial sense to put these consumer grade devices onto the cellular network, not only from a hardware cost, but the ongoing airtime is going to fall as well. So it might have cost dollars per month to connect a device. Now it's going to cost pennies per month. So you're going to start to see Wi-Fi being taken out of a lot of devices. And in the previous podcast, I actually talked about that. Will 5G replace a lot of the Wi-Fi modules inside of consumer devices, especially in the smart home? And I think it will. When we come back from a few second break, we're going to cover points 6 to 10. Back in five seconds. Number six. One great marketing tactic is to build up excitement for your product at the time of launch. Companies normally do this by creating a lot of pre-launch hype for their product. And 5G is definitely in that pre-hype phase right now. One of the problems is, though, is that it's nowhere close to being available in many parts of the country. You hear talk about 5G, and you even hear devices that are going to have 5G soon. But it's really only available in some pretty limited testing. And if it is available commercially today, it's going to be in small areas. So I think there was a couple of cities in the U.S. that were somewhat widely available. Most 5G is being tested in a lab, however, or perhaps on a few test sites. So it's going to be a while away. And this is especially true if you're in a rural area. One of the problems that 5G is going to bring up for a lot of the carriers is that the amount of data being sent is supposed to skyrocket. Not only are you going to see devices being capable, as I mentioned, of five, six, eight times better speed, but you're also going to see many more devices. And while that's great, the carriers make money that way, one issue that brings up is how do you get that information back to the internet? Yes, the technology is there. The carriers can put in fiber lines and other technology, But now think about a fiber line to the middle of a farmer's field. It's going to be a while before you start seeing connectivity, especially as I mentioned, the cell towers simply don't go as far when it comes to throwing signal. So don't expect to have 5G at the cottage anytime soon, depending on where your cottage is. And on to number seven. The other thing I'm sorry to be the one to break the bad news to you is that your existing iPhone 8 will not be able to work on 5G. Don't get me wrong, when 5G launches, it doesn't stop working, but it only works on the current network that it's on now. 
you are going to need entirely new devices to access 5G. And some people are going to just do it anyways. The first day that a 5G phone comes out, they're going to buy one. But I kind of caution people, do you really think you need it? It's kind of like my neighbor who mentioned to me that he now subscribes to a 250 megabyte internet service for the house, which is the kind of pipe you would want to have for a big business. But it's just him and his wife. And what they pretty much do is watch Netflix. Well, they could use a connection that's one fifth or even one tenth that speed and not even notice the difference. And that's what I think a lot of people will have to realize is that it's not going to be the be all and end all you might not actually notice the difference at all. But when it does come out, expect that smartphones will be the first devices to have 5G on board. And then perhaps things like USB sticks and some other tablets and things like that. And then you're going to start to see it make its way into other products like cellular gateways and routers. So now we're going to talk about for the last three points is how 5G is going to change the world. And so point number eight is how it's going to change many businesses. Today, most business takes place in some kind of a fixed location. And I'm not talking about e-commerce here. What I'm talking about is business itself. So you go into a law office, you go into a store, you go into any other service place. And that was because there was a lot of things that were required. You know, the lawyers need their computers, they needed access to their books, and, you know, a hospital needs the equipment. So that kind of makes sense. And those aren't going to be moving anytime soon. But more and more, business is becoming mobile, whether it's into people's homes, whether that's, you know, third party locations, whether that's mobile equipment and mobile services out in the field like delivery. And 5G is going to make that even better because 4G offered pretty good connectivity speed. There wasn't much you couldn't do from a business standpoint in terms of connectivity. However, it wasn't compelling enough for people to cut the cord at the office. There simply weren't the rate plans available and the speed wasn't enough for most offices to even consider going for cellular only. That's not the case with 5G. For the first time, most companies could truly consider cutting their internet connection from their landline provider and not see any noticeable degradation for their business. So that law office doesn't need to have a high-speed fiber line coming in. They could use a cellular connection. And where that changes a lot of industries is places like transportation and retail, because it now allows them not only the potential of having lower cost, but it gives them that flexibility in case they wanted to do something like have full connectivity outside, for instance. A retail store might decide, today we want to have something in the parking lot. It's a lot easier now if all your devices are connected by cellular. And the same goes for other areas as well. Point number nine is kind of interesting because it it kind of refers back to what I was talking about with my stove. It's that many things in your life are going to have a cell bill attached to them now, but you probably won't be the one paying it most of the time. And what I'm referring to is, go back to that stove. Chances are that the information being gathered from the stove is most valuable to the manufacturer. Sure, maybe you want to get notified if the stove is used when you're not home, But that could be by by Wi-Fi as well. The real benefit to using 5G for the stove is for the manufacturer to gather information. And in this case, they're the one that's going to be paying the cell bill. They're going to have a deal with one of the providers. The device will come into your house connected. When you power it in, it will establish the connection to the cell network and it will start transmitting whatever information they want. You might wonder, that sounds a little creepy. Well, that's what's being done with your car and other devices for well over a decade now. Your cars all have cellular modules, unless your car is over, say, 20 years old. The manufacturer has been gathering information for years. How do you think OnStar and other similar applications work? This is how they open your car door if it gets locked, things like that. However, 5G is going to expedite that. So before, it was always high-value assets like your car. Now you might have have as many as 5, 10, 30 devices over the next few years that are all going to be on the cell network. It's going to mean that most things in your life are going to be always connected and you're not going to be the one that actually does the connecting. So I'll let you determine if that has a creepiness factor to it or not. Number 10 is how it's going to expedite the cable cutting of the world. And in this case, I'm talking not only about cable being cut, So people talk about, you know, how Netflix is taking over the world and those kind of services. 
It's also going to have people cut the cord when it comes to their fixed wired internet connection. Many people don't have a home phone, and a lot of people also don't have cable. But even millennials tend to have a wired connection to their home for internet. And that's because the cost of browsing per megabyte was simply too high for cellular devices. There weren't many all you can eat plans uh, in the cell world. If you have one, great, but there was always limitations of some kind. So most people tended to have a wired connection. 5G will change that, and I'm curious to see how much of that change is going to be endorsed by the carriers. People are going to do it anyways, because 5G truly will offer low enough rates that it makes sense to cut the cord. I'm just wondering if people are going to do it and the carriers are going to just hold their nose, or are you actually going to see rate plans where the carriers say, cut the cord? The reason why I bring that up is that most cell carriers out there in the world are not alone in the company. They often have another part of the company that sells those wire connections. So I'm curious to see how much cannibalization there's going to be when it comes to this. But when you start seeing 5G come out and you're getting speeds that are approaching fiber light connection, I think people will switch to it, especially for people that tend to be very active. So if you have a cottage, for instance, or if you're always like me sitting in the stands while your kids have practices and games, being able to take that connectivity with you with one bill is very compelling. And I think especially the millennials will definitely do that pretty quickly. I hope you enjoyed this podcast. I look forward to having you listen to future ones. As a reminder, they're available every Thursday. I also humbly ask that you subscribe to this podcast using your favorite podcast service and look forward to having you come back again. Thanks for listening. I'm Larry Bohumer. 